Welcome to our session, um, Humanizing Deportation, Research and Care in the Herida Abierta. I'm Emily Davidson from the Hispanic and Latino Studies Program. Thank you all for being here with us today. I'm very excited to be here. Um, two quick technical notes. The chat function is available um, during our webinar. However, if you have a question for um, the Q&A after the presentation, please use the Q&A the option um, to submit your questions. Um, before I introduce our amazing keynote speaker, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Today, we acknowledge the Nisqually, Puyallup, Squaxin Island, and Stilicum peoples, traditional caretakers, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture the land that PLU sits on since time immemorial. I would also like to honor local indigenous activists and water warriors for their ongoing protest of the Tacoma LNG refining facility located on the Tacoma Tide Flats on the ancestral territory of the Puyallup tribe. These protests connect to the topic that brings us here today of humanizing deportation, making it visible. Given that an environmental disaster at the liquid natural gas facility would impact the lives of the peoples unjustly held at the Northwest Detention Center, just a few miles away, which is one of the largest for-profit detention facilities in the nation. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Quisiera hacer una intervención crítica. I'd like to make a critical intervention. As a graduate student of our keynote speaker today, Dr. Robert McKee Irwin, I became accustomed to hearing him say this phrase, quisiera hacer una intervención crítica. I'd like to make a critical intervention. Whenever Dr. Irwin would say this, we all knew what was coming next a series of questions that would leave us pondering, insightful challenges to our assumptions, an invitation to deeper inquiry or new directions in our studies. Critical interventions are at the heart of Dr. Irwin's impressive career as a professor, researcher, mentor, and human rights activist. Dr. Irwin is professor in the UC Davis Department of Spanish and Portuguese and Deputy Director of the UC Davis Global Migration Center. As a specialist in Mexican and Mexican, -Ameri and Mexican American cultural history with expertise in issues of gender and sexuality, borders and migration and transnationalism, Dr. Irwin is the author of several books that have pu pushed the established boundaries of this field of study, contributing to a querying of the archives and greater attention to borderlands contact zones and the people who in inhabit them. Mexican masculinities in 2003, bandits, captives, heroines, and saints, cultural icons of Mexico's Northwest borderlands in 2007, Los 41, novela crítico social de Eduardo Castrejón in 2010. He has also co-authored and co-edited works that have made important critical interventions in the field of Latinx slash Latin American cultural studies, greatly influencing debates nationally and internationally around disciplinary boundaries and modeling new approaches to the study of a wide array of cultural productions. Noteworthy among these contributions are the Dictionary of Latin American Cultural Studies, Global Mexican Cinema, Its Golden Age, and Sports and Nationalism in Latino, Latin America. In 2016, when he was the chair of the graduate group in cultural studies and co-director of the Mellon Initiative in Comparative Border Studies, Dr. Irwin began his ongoing role as coordinator of the Humanizing Deportation Digital Storytelling Project that he will tell us about today. Digital storytelling, both as a genre and as a praxis, constitutes a critical intervention in the way that stories are produced, disseminated, and studied. In collaboration with colleagues from several Mexican universities, Humanizando la Deportación has come to be a massive, 
bilingual public archive of testimonial narratives about migration and deportation, the largest qualitative database of its kind. His current research draws from this archive with a focus on issues of migration, affect, and masculinity. Dr. Irwin, Robert, we are so honored to have you here in this virtual space and thank you in advance for the critical interventions that you will make today. Thank you so much, Emily uh, Davidson for that uh, beautiful introduction, flattering introduction. Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, a good friend and colleague for a number of years, Samara Williams, for the uh, invitation to present at this forum to the WAMP Center uh, and for all of the people at Pacific Lutheran, including Rosemary Reynolds and Travis Pagel that have helped make this possible. It's wonderful to be here. It's really wonderful to be, uh, let, me, let me get my screen up, uh, just one second. Here we go. It's wonderful to be at an event that's focused on healing. Uh, in a time when it seems that everyone dedicates a lot of energy to other things. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really wonderful to have this whole event focused on this. So what I'm going to present today is this project that uh, Emily mentioned, Humanizando la Deportación, uh, and give you some idea about how it came about and how we have managed to keep it going uh, and how we manage the combination of research and care uh, in the context of the humanities. And so uh, I'm going to start with a video, I'm sorry, with a quote from uh, Gloria Anzaldúa, which is where Herida Abierta, the open wound, uh, comes from in my title. Uh, this is from Borderlands La Frontera. Many of you maybe know this text, US-Mexico border, es una herida abierta, where Mexico grates against the United States and bleeds, and before a scab farms and hemorrhages again. This is from 1987, uh, long before many of you in the audience were born. And it's, it's very sad that uh, Mexico, the U.S.-Mexico border continues to be an open wound that has been crowded and really kind of um, savaged uh, in the last couple of years. It's a shame, but this is where we are, and this is where Humanizando la Deportación works. Let's see a video. The first video that we produced in this project from 2017. Mi nombre es Gerardo. Voy a relatarles lo que ha sido mi deportación. Fui, fui deportado a la ciudad de Tijuana. Viví dos años en Estados Unidos. En esos dos años conocí a mi esposa, con la cual tuve dos hijas. Esas dos hijas que, pues, quedaron sin padre. Les voy a comentar de lo que son mis hijas, pues, ellas están chicas y aún extrañan a su papá de que no está con ellas. En esos dos años tuve un tropiezo en el cual me detuvieron por andar tomando, pues, borracho. Ese tropiezo me llevó a de que si yo pensaba arreglar papeles en el futuro, pues ya no lo puedo hacer por ese motivo. El momento de mi redada fue cuando estaba trabajando. Llegaron ellos y un agente de inmigración dijo, ahora sí se van a ir a comer nopales y frijoles a su México querido, dijo. En ese momento nos llevaron a una cárcel, una cárcel pues de la misma migración. Son lugares que por afuera se mira que están muy bonitos, pero por dentro se vive la realidad como 40 personas en un, se dicen tanques, son como celdas, que no hay camas, no tienen un baño, como les digo, no hay camas, se tienen que dormir en el piso, y a veces encimados, porque es tanta gente que meten en una sola celda, que no cabe, no cabe la gente, en, en esa celda, en esas este, detenciones, te quieren tener este amarrado, hasta las 24 horas, te quieren tener esposado, Sales al doctor, vas esposado. Sales a, al baño, vas este esposado. El trato que te dan los agentes de inmigración adentro de una cárcel es cruel. Abusan de la persona cuando no les entiende su, su idioma a ellos. Te dicen cosas que son ofensivas para ti. 
te maltratan física y moralmente también. Si te lastimas mucho no puedes hablar con nadie, con un abogado, no puedes hablar con, con tu familia para decirles lo que estás viviendo adentro. Cuando me deportaron a México pues no tenía a nadie aquí en, en Tijuana, que es donde estoy viviendo ahorita en estos momentos. Los primeros días fueron estresantes para mí porque pues no tenía a nadie, no tenía un techo, no tenía una cama, no tenía alimentos para poder este, comer, así de que tuve que vivir en las calles. También no, no podía comunicarme con mi familia porque pues no, no tenía los números de teléfono que necesitaba para hablar con ellos hasta que pude ir al a lugar donde se encuentran mis padres y, y obtener los números de teléfono para comunicarme con mi familia. Mientras eso pasó, estuve viviendo momentos que en realidad para mí fueron muy, muy malos, en, en los cuales tuve que pedir ayuda a mucha gente. Ahorita, hasta ahorita en este momento estoy viviendo momentos que todavía no, los, no logro asimilar, no, no, no logro este, comprenderlos bien aún. Que estoy aquí y, y aún estoy solo, aunque viene mi familia de Estados Unidos a, ver, a verme, pues no, no me siento completamente bien realizado porque... Pues el vivir solo aquí en México, en un lugar donde nadie te conoce, que tienes que buscar el pan de cada día todos los días, porque no tienes un lugar fijo donde vivir, que no tienes este, a tu familia, que tú les puedes echar la mano a ellos y ellos te pueden echar la mano a ti. Eso no es vivir, esto no es vivir aquí, lo que estoy viviendo. Después de todo esto, he buscado la manera de, de volver a cruzar Estados Unidos, pero no he podido. Traté de cruzar como cuatro o cinco veces. La primera vez que hice cruzarme por el desierto, traté de cruzar por Arizona. Ya casi llegaba a una ciudad que se llama Tucson y me arrestaron, me volvieron a deportar. Me vine para Tijuana y aquí en Tijuana quise cruzar por un lugar que se llama El Nido de las Águilas. Por ahí también fracasé dos veces. Después quise cruzar por playas de Tijuana también. Ahí mismo también me, me detuvieron. Faltaba mucho para llegar a, una, a San Diego y me detuvieron y fui deportado nuevamente a Tijuana. Después, por última vez, quise cruzar pegadito a la línea, ahí por donde entra toda la gente. Y me, me detuvieron, me deportaron, pero esa vez me llevaron con un juez de migración, el cual me dijo que si volví a intentar cruzar y me detenían, me dijo que me iba a dar hasta 30 meses de cárcel, por el cual motivo ya no, no quiero volver a cruzar. Les voy a platicar sobre de lo que ha sido los asuntos personales con mi familia. Pues al momento en que me deportaron, como les platicaba anteriormente, duré como un mes para poder obtener comunicación con mi esposa y mis hijas. Ya después de eso, mi familia viene cada mes, cada dos meses, pues ellos se sienten tranquilos y a la vez también yo, aunque no completamente feliz porque pues no estoy con ellos para siempre. Yo quisiera estar con ellos siempre. No puedo por los motivos de que pues una línea, una línea divisoria nos divide. En realidad, este, pues, este mensaje que les mando a todo, a, a todo el mundo es para que sepan que las deportaciones que están haciendo pues, es una cosa muy desagradable porque están, están rompiendo relaciones, están rompiendo familias, están haciendo pedazos a muchos sentimientos hacia la persona que es deportada. Pues tengo que asimilar de que aquí me voy a quedar de que ya no puedo estar en Estados Unidos con mi familia, de que ellos van a tener que estar viniendo aquí a, a visitarme y, y no yo poder ir para Estados Unidos, de que ya no tengo más opciones, no tengo más papel de dónde cortar, tratar de asimilar las cosas y ojalá que mi familia entienda de que yo no puedo estar allá y de que juntos no vamos a poder estar para siempre, digamos así. So uh, that was the very first video that we produced in 2017 for Humanizing Deportation. It, it summarizes a lot of the issues that began to arise as we began to see from deported people's point of view, the damage done by our immigration system. And if you want uh, to understand this more, I encourage you to browse our website. Uh, it's big, there's a lot of videos there. There's an index, there's a page that says for researchers where you can search by theme and you can find out all kinds of information from the perspective of uh, migrants. 
And so I wanted to signal these two, story, two stories in particular at the beginning. I'm not going to show you the second one, but I encourage you to watch it. It's number four on our website. Uh, it's because they appear in our logo. Uh, on the left of our logo, we see this painting of a heart being crossed over the border. And it comes from a painting that Emma Sanchez painted from Tijuana to where, where she was living when she had been deported. Uh, her video and the painting are titled, The Wall Separates Families But Never Feelings. Uh, and her um, video tells the story, a really kind of moving story, an incredible story of how she lived uh, on, in Tijuana with her husband and children, three sons living, all US citizens, the son, the husband, a uh, 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 veteran of the US Marines living on the US side. And they would come to visit her every weekend, year after year. And they would drive back and wait in the long lines to cross the border. The family was really uh, bonded very, very strongly. Incredible that that is what happened because that's not, I think what usually happens when families get separated by deportation. Her story has a happy ending. Um, she arrived in the US in 2002, got married in 2000, I'm uh, oh, sorry, 2000, got married in 2002, and then was deported four years later. Uh, her three sons had already been born, uh, and the family separation started at that point. Uh, eventually, she became a lead uh, player in a group called Dreamers Moms that has done uh, a number of kind of active and cultural events from Tijuana, which I think was helpful to her in keeping her dream alive and also getting access to some legal support. We did the first video in June of 2017. And the following December, after 12 years of family separation, she was finally able to return to the US as a legal permanent resident and has been living there since. We did a second video titled Separated by Inflexible Laws, Reunited by Unshakable Love uh, the following year. And uh, so that's her story, uh, which has a happy ending. The other half of our logo is this guy with a backpack. And you may recognize that silhouette from Los Sanchez's video. And this is his story, which is more unfortunate. Uh, I don't know that it's typical exactly, but uh, he migrated around when Emma did in 2001, got deported in 2013. Uh, and when we went to Tijuana in November of 2016 to train our first fieldwork team, he was hanging around and he offered to give us a tour at Eduardo, uh, which you can see here in this photo. It's a canal that runs along the U.S.-Mexico border on the Mexican side where they had for a long time been homeless camps of people. And uh, so that's that space and what it was like. Uh, and we did his digital story soon after that. Uh, and then he collaborated us with, quite a, with us quite a lot after that. He, he appreciated what we said to other men. Uh, and I saw him kind of all the time between January and September. Uh, unfortunately, in October of 2017, he was assassinated by uh, a drug gang at the shelter where he was uh, working uh, and living. So that was his story. And so anyway, uh, just so you get an idea of kind of the range of stories uh, and situations. And our, our goal was originally focused on deportation back in 2016 around the presidential elections. There was a lot of negative rhetoric about migration. It was mostly about undocumented migrants in the US. We were really concerned about who was getting deported because it wasn't clear that the people who were getting deported were the ones that everyone thought was getting deported who were, were like uh, criminal <laughs> migrants. And also how, people were being affected by deportation because a lot of people, I think, believed that people were just being sent home where they were gonna comfortably adjust to life in Mexico. And so we started with that uh, and eventually expanded not just to talk about deportation or look, about, look at deportation, but also look in general about how border security and migration control laws and policies in the US uh, and in Mexico were affecting migrants. And so the method we opted to use was digital storytelling, which is a community-based participatory media genre in which the storytellers, the community, community storytellers, including Gerardo Sanchez in the video that you saw, are the creators and directors of the video. They decide what the content is going to be. They say what they want to say, how they want to say it, and then they design uh, the, uh, the visual part of it. We don't 
film them very much and sometimes not at all. Uh, instead, we help them find the kinds of images that they want to illustrate their story. Uh, and so the research team members, uh, our team members are facilitators. We are not documentary filmmakers. We're not doing ethnographic interviews. We're not doing journalism. We're helping people tell their stories. And so it's a genre that's usually used for community activism and sometimes for pedagogy, and we're adapting it into a research context. This is kind of uh, innovative, what, what we're doing, because we're using all of the methods of digital storytelling, but to carry out research. Uh, and the research is in the form of these testimonial narratives. So that is not in itself research. We're just producing stories that anybody could produce on social media or they can show up on the news or whatever. Uh, and the migrants are the authors. So we're not actually asking research questions to determine the content of the stories. We're helping migrants tell their stories. But once they're told, they're posted into our archive and they become uh, a vast, or it has become a vast archive of information about migration told from the migrants' point of view. For us, keywords are authenticity and ownership. It's really important that the authors of the stories own the stories, they really feel that they're their stories and that they don't belong to the University of California. Uh, all kinds of themes have come up. You can see some of them here, family separation, as you saw in, in Gerardo's video, uh, the plight of childhood arrivals who get sent to a country where they may not speak the language well, they may not really kind of know anything, they may never have visited there since they left as a small child, uh, stories of deported military veterans, people who consider themselves patriots, of the US and have served in the military, uh, stories about abuses in migrant detention centers, lack of due process in deportation and other kinds of migration proceedings, uh, and then how people can end up in Mexico hopeless, desperate. They may end up on the street. They may end up getting uh, addicted to substances. They also may get stigmatized and harassed, especially by police authorities in Mexico. So we document all of this. And eventually we started doing some other kind of stories, stories not just of deported migrants, but also of refugees and migrants in transit. I'm just gonna show one other video today and that's gonna be this one uh, to give you an idea of the scope of what we've been doing. Soy un inmigrante. Actualmente mi documentación está en Honduras. Mi mamá biológica me regaló cuando yo tenía seis meses a una señora salvadoreña. Ella me llevó con ella a El Salvador, en San Salvador, y ella uh, nos vendía uh, sexualmente. De los seis años eh, empezó a traficarnos. Nos metía con un hombre, con otro hombre. Uh, habían personas muy groseras, nos agredían, nos amarraban, o sea, nos hacían como ellos querían. Según iba transcurriendo el tiempo, yo iba despertando mi mente. Cuando yo llegué a la edad de mis 12, 13 años, yo me empecé a defender por mí mismo. E incluso hubo uno de los señores con que los metían, el que me agredió más, yo tomé odio contra él. Y un día, cuando yo tenía los 13 años, yo tomé la decisión de, se me vino a la mente, golpearlo. Lo golpeé muy fuerte, lo desmayé y luego me escapé, nos escapamos todos y buscamos ayuda a la policía, todo esto, a la señora la que nos vendía allá, la metieron presa y todo eso, hicieron investigaciones a fondo y todo. Cuando salí de esta, ellos mismos nos pusieron con familias que hacían cargo a nosotros porque éramos unos chavillos que no teníamos quién. Y entonces yo me fui con una familia. Eh, hasta mis 17 años yo me crecí con ellos. Pero hasta que yo di mis 17 años yo me empecé a independizar por mí mismo. Empecé a ver mis raíces y viajé a Honduras, donde una mi tía. Y luego en el trayecto de viajes de El Salvador a Honduras, un día conocí incluso a mi pareja actual. Luego nos enamoramos, intentamos hacer una vida juntos. Esa es nuestra historia, llevándola juntos. Bueno, aquí empiezo yo, yo y la pareja de él. La verdad que sí, fue un amor como a primera vista porque hemos durado bastante tiempo. Cuando estuvimos en Honduras, la homofobia y todo eso no nos ha dejado vivir. Nuestra familia aún tampoco nos los quiere por ser como somos, somos de, de la comunidad. Fuimos violentados por, por cuestiones de trabajo, por ejemplo, nos mudamos como unos siete lugares en Honduras. 
por eso mismo donde yo trabajaba pues yo no decía que era gay no decía eso porque los mismos empleados se volvían en contra de uno y le empezaban a decir cosas e incluso hay unas empresas que no lo contratan a uno por el hecho de ser gay e incluso fingía fingía muchas veces que me gustaban las mujeres y intentamos vivir en Honduras cuando cuando eso de la pandemia entonces nosotros lo sentimos como obligados más obligados a irnos de nuestro país porque ya éramos más vulnerables tanto para las maras o como para la misma gente o los malandros de la comunidad. Sentíamos que nos podían hacer algo porque ya nosotros encerrados, digamos, en una casa o un cuarto donde rentábamos, ya nos miraban si iba a comprar el supe, o sea, compartir más a menudo algo con alguien. Entonces ya se empezaron a correr rumores y fue que salimos de Honduras un domingo a las 3 de la mañana para que nadie los mirara. Y así decidimos viajar por Guatemala y llegamos pues a Tecumán. Cuando llegamos allá a Tecumán, nos pasaron ahí del río, incluso ¿no? y llegamos a Tapachula. En Tapachula nos quedamos en la calle, no teníamos a nadie, solo llegamos como con 10 pesos. Para poder comer nosotros eh, nos ayudaba una señora. Estamos con una señora ahí, lo llevamos muy bien, le ayudábamos en sus cosas y así nos daba la comida. Poco tiempo después nos enteramos de que sí podíamos solicitar asilo en, aquí en México y empezamos a hacer nuestro trámite en coma. Siempre con el mismo miedo nosotros decidimos decir que nos éramos pareja. Así que yo hice un caso y él abrió otro caso. Pero, pero llegando a México y antes de conocer a la señora, nos intentaron secuestrar. Una señora que tenía conexión con las madres del Salvador. Nos encerró, no solo a mí, nos encerró a mucha gente, como con 10 personas. Creo que nos, no sé, nos iban a mandar para otro lado. La verdad no, no teníamos en mente qué podíamos hacer, pero el encierro nos, como que nos activó la mente. Y sí, salimos por una puerta que estaba como medio dañada. Bajamos una botella y empezamos a abrirla. Pero de ahí, un poco tiempo después, varios de los que estábamos ahí, nos hicimos amigos y, y a muchos lo siguieron. Pasó eso, todo, todo eso de persecución. Salimos de ahí, bueno, la señora nos, nos dio dinero, por cierto, para rentar. Empezamos a rentar, buscamos trabajo y así fue que vivimos. Pero más adelante no sabíamos lo que, lo que en realidad esperábamos. Conocimos a un amigo tuyo, ¿no? Bueno, de los dos prácticamente, y, y empezamos a convivir, ¿no? Porque empezábamos a salir y todo eso, pero no sabíamos que Tapachula también era un lugar peligroso. Él, eh, muy buena persona, por cierto, se portó muy bien al principio, y luego él se obsesionó conmigo, más conmigo. Llegó a los extremos de a drogarme y a abusar de mí sexualmente. Luego a mi pareja lo persiguieron contra él para perderlo o matarlo. Entonces tomamos la decisión de que él viajara a otro estado y luego yo me quedé por el miedo de que fuera a pasar algo en contra de nosotros y cuando ya tomamos la decisión de él se fue y de luego yo tomé la decisión y viajé también, incluso viajé a otro estado de México y sentía el miedo, sentí el miedo de que, o sea, él tiene muchos contactos, muchos conectes por muchos estados de México y luego tomamos la decisión de venirnos a la frontera, a ambos, para solicitar asilo en Estados Unidos. Y, no sé, hacer una vida juntos en Estados Unidos, eh, vivir sin miedo a la homofobia, a exponer nuestras vidas. Quisiera agregar que estamos haciendo esto para que las personas de Estados Unidos o de otros lugares se den cuenta de lo que... Vivimos diariamente en Centroamérica, muchos niños se exponen a ser violentados y bueno, lo que nosotros en realidad buscamos es la felicidad. Nosotros en un principio buscábamos quedarnos en México, pero con lo que nos pasó ahí en el estado de Chiapas, nosotros ya no fue una opción quedarnos aquí por miedo a que nos pudieran algo. Y bueno, la única opción que tenemos aquí es seguir más para arriba, más para adelante y pedir un asilo a Estados Unidos, que también aún vivimos con ese miedo que Estados Unidos los pueda deportar y que en Honduras o en El Salvador nos puedan, no sé, corren peligro en nuestras vidas, pues. Y la verdad que no queremos eso porque somos de la comunidad y, y comúnmente no somos apoyados. Casi nunca somos apoyados y siempre la sociedad nos hace un lado. Entonces, eh, para nosotros vivir en Estados Unidos, nosotros queremos empezar una nueva vida, no queremos volver a nuestros lugares. Incluso tenemos una idea de negocio, nosotros no vamos a dañar a Estados Unidos, más bien vamos a ayudar al país más que todo. Nos ayudan ellos y nosotros le ayudamos a, a ellos. So uh, that, that video shows you uh, a completely different kind of story. These are stories uh, in our archive as well of migrants heading northward. 
fleeing violence, uh, all kinds of reasons, dealing with all kinds of things along the way and at the border. Uh, and so all of this is in our archive. Uh, the, we started off thinking we were going to produce one or two dozen stories. That was what we put in our first grant application. We ended up that first year producing 50. There was much more demand on the part of migrants to make their stories known. Uh, migrants are uh, deported migrants, for example, pretty much forgot about once they leave the U.S. People defend them, fight for them while they're in ICE custody. But once they get deported, it's kind of the end of their story. They go into the abyss. And migrants in transit, they're, they're not here yet. Uh, so many different kinds of stories. Anyway, we, we did 50 the first year in Tijuana. Uh, the second year, we started working in new collaborations all over Mexico. Uh, and we did a, produce a whole lot more stories. Uh, including uh, with the arrival of the caravans in late 2018, our first migrants in transit. Uh, the following year, we also went to Mexico's southern border, to Tapachula, and worked. And uh, this year, we did, uh, during the pandemic, we even, uh, at the very end of it, managed to get uh, one of our team members to Ecuador. And so we're currently working mainly in Tijuana, trying to get uh, stories about migration during the pandemic, deportation during the pandemic and figuring out what that means. But you can see the size of our story, 373 stories total. Uh, some of them are multi-part stories. Uh, so we have 306 community storytellers. Our team is from UC Davis, but we've also collaborated with several other uni Mexican universities, uh, continue actively with El Colegio La Frontera Norte in Tijuana. Uh, we've had faculty members and grad students uh, independent scholars working with us in the field and a large contingent of undergrads who help with us behind the scenes. They help with translations, transcriptions, subtitles. Uh, and so the additional kinds of issues that have come up as we started working with these more diverse migrants, uh, refugees are the reasons people are fleeing, uh, the dangerous routes they follow, their dependence on and vulnerability to organized crime, uh, the lack of due process that is sometimes applied to asylum seekers by the U.S., and the very kind of troublesome programs that have been in effect for the past couple of years, including the Remain in Mexico program, which was recently revi revived by the courts, and Title 42, uh, which was implemented by the Centers for Disease Control that essentially has closed the border to uh, asylum seekers, except for uh, children and some other exceptions. Unaccompanied minors have been allowed across and some others, but many migrants have are, are just waiting and have been waiting uh, for a couple of years at the southern border. And so what do we do with all of this? Uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, so we do community outreach presentations like this one in academic settings, presentations in uh, community with community groups, uh, we help activist groups such as the Dreamers Moms. We produce their videos. They can use their videos for their activism. Uh, we do media outreach and try to get into the press whenever we can to draw attention to these stories. Uh, the archive is obviously very useful for teaching, and it's become a wonderful source for researching migration. Uh, we have a book coming out called Migrant Feelings, Migrant Knowledge, the Humanizing Deportation Project. It'll be out in the fall. A couple of other books are in, in press as well in Spanish. Uh, these materials can be used for policy recommendations. We've done that. They've been used as le legal evidence in deportation proceedings, appeals of deportation, uh, and just kind of community building. Some of the key concepts, I'm just going to mention them here in case you're interested in the kinds of research approaches that we take. Uh, so this is a kind of an academic slide. Uh, and I can give you uh, the articles or books that I'm referring to, but the vernacular creativity of migrants is a key concept for us. The importance of storytelling as a research tool, uh, social death, the kinds of, um, when I said migrants fall into the abyss, where they are when they have no voice and how we try to give them a place where they can express themselves publicly. Uh, border thinking, uh, the autonomy of migration, migrant world making. I think you can get the idea that we, we believe the reason why we do digital storytelling is because we are not the experts on migration. We are not the experts on deportation. The experts are the migrants who have 
experience what it's like to go through these processes. And so we believe that they have knowledge that we want to help them share. And so border as method means we need to be at the border. Uh, we need to be uh, there listening to them, giving them the platform and kind of being involved. We've done all kinds of other things uh, in, in, aside from just recording stories. We've had uh, Leo Pena, a uh, uh, photo photographic artist, take portraits of a number of our uh, community storytellers, which we then have been able to exhibit in some of some public events, some public ex ex expositions that we have been able to organize. Uh, we also give copies to the migrants. One of these was at Enclave Caracol in downtown Tijuana in February 2019. It was We were there for like three weeks. We did film screenings, we showed videos, we did uh, collaborative events with community groups. Uh, the photo you see on the screen, there's a number of deported migrants who had done their visual, visual stories with us who came to our opening reception and did a QA with the answer, uh, with, with the audience, sorry. And these are some of the ways that we have been able to kind of engage community building. In Davis, uh, we did a, a similar month-long event at International House. Uh, one of the most kind of innovative parts of it uh, was done by Sarah Hart, who you see here uh, speaking. Um, but she is a performance studies student who designed a contact improvisation exercise for a community who attended, where they saw one of the humanizing deportation videos, and then they responded with their bodies in pairs. It was really an amazing uh, event of kind of empathy, corporal kind of um, digesting and understanding of a story. Uh, can't talk about any of this in detail, but I just want to give you the, an idea of the scope of what has grown out of this project. Another one of our grad students, Lisbeth de la Cruz, designed a mural. Uh, she had grant funding and was able to produce this mural. It's in Playa de Tijuana at the very, very western end of the U.S.-Mexico border with portraits of migrants, most of whom are from our archive. And they have barcodes. And if you scan the barcode, it takes them to, your dig to their digital story. And you can there on the beach in Plaza de Tijuana uh, see the digital story on your telephone of these migrants. We've worked with community groups. For example, Alma Migrante is a legal services group in Tijuana who liked our concept of digital stories and wanted to produce digital stories of human rights defenders. And so we, we coupled with the University of San Diego and trained their students to produce digital stories uh, not of migrants, but those who defend the rights of migrants uh, who have very hard lives uh, in Tijuana. We brought people from the UC Davis Law School. We're going to do this again in two weeks uh, to Tijuana to offer legal consulting to deported migrants and migrants in transit. We have helped a migrant who, Douglas <laughs> Oviedo, you can see his digital story, a really amazing story number 166 in our archive, he wrote a book while he was waiting out his asylum process in the Remain in Mexico program in Tijuana. And we helped him publish his book. We never thought we'd be getting into the publishing business, but we did. I encourage you to look for Caravaneros. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, it tells his kind of dramatized testimonial of his experience migrating in the caravan, the caravans of 2018. We did another project producing short videos with the um, Franciscan um, Order of the Catholic Church, who have a series of migrant shelters and uh, um, food kitchens. And we did a series of three videos helping to try to inform migrants about what to expect while migrating. What are the legal uh, implications of trying to become an asylum seeker? Uh, or to apply for refugee status in Mexico. And we've especially been, and I'm, I'm going to conclude uh, very soon, we've especially been very fortunate and really kind of have uh, put energy into collaborating with some of the storytellers in our archive. And so uh, community building happens in Tijuana. Uh, we don't, we're not located in Tijuana, we're at UC Davis, it's in the north of California, so we can't be in Tijuana constantly. But uh, the fact that we have been able to produce so many stories 
almost half of them in our, in our archive are from Tijuana, has allowed us to kind of get involved uh, in, in things there uh, in, in the world of migrant care. Uh, some people think we're in Tijuana, that we're an NGO. Some of them assume we have an office in Tijuana, but we just go there to visit. Uh, but anyway, Danny Ruiz, who is a deported uh, childhood arrival, whose video in our archive is number 165, um, was able after, I don't know how many years, he's been deported about 20 years, maybe about 10 years ago. He kind of worked his way up through the call center business and eventually founded his own call center. So he has his own business. He's an entrepreneur. He's doing well. And so he started using a portion of his revenues to give back to the community. And he founded a community center called the Borderline Crisis Center. You can see me at the bottom uh, presenting there some of our videos. That's uh, uh, Isabel Turcios, who's from the Red Franciscana para Migrantes. She has a migrant shelter in Piedras Negras along the Texas border. And she was uh, presenting with us that day from there. But anyway, we've been using this community space that he dedicates to migrants, to offering them access to phones and bathroom and things that they need. And it also ended up becoming a migrant shelter, uh, an emergency migrant shelter. There's so many people waiting, accumulated at the border now that he has taken in families. Uh, and you can see how migrant shelters are uh, in Tijuana. Uh, they're living in tents on the floor in this community center. And anyway, it's really, it's really wonderful for us to collaborate with Danny, who uh, at the time he told the story with us just had a bunch of ideas. But gradually, I think in part through some of the connections he made through humanizing deportation, he has really kind of like taken off and is doing all kinds of things in support of migrants in Tijuana. Another is Esther Morales, who was one of the first to share her story with us in Tijuana in uh, 2017, uh, a story of her own deportation and how she eventually was able to, uh, to found a small business selling tamales, making and selling tamales in downtown Tijuana. And over the course of time, uh, she has become more and more interested in community activism and supporting migrants and over the pandemic, she, in collaboration with Al Otro Lado, which is a legal services organization uh, based in LA and San Diego and Tijuana, uh, started delivering her tamales and other food to migrant shelters and to migrants, uh, homeless migrants living on the street in a program that she called Comida Calientita. We made a video of it. You can watch it. It's number 11E on our archive. And since that time, since we've been able to get back to Tijuana after a long period when we were prohibited from traveling by the university, um, so starting in the late summer of 2021, uh, we've been back in Tijuana and we've been collaborating with Estet. And so what we do is uh, in order to kind of get a foothold into some migrant shelters is, is we go with her. And so we bring food, uh, we serve food, uh, tamales, or rather food that she makes in migrant shelters. And then it gives us the opportunity to get to know some of the migrants. And some of them, like the two Honduran, Honduran guys who you saw in the previous video, uh, we met at one of these events and decided they wanted to share their story with us. And uh, this is how we've kind of remained active. And we're really uh, thrilled to be able to kind of support Esther as she tries to kind of grow her own profile and do more uh, community work, even as she is kind of a struggling uh, single woman running a small business that can be very precarious. And so uh, uh, I think I have shown kind of some of the history and scope and really uh, it's well, well, well beyond anything we could have ever imagined. Uh, when we started off in 2016, hoping to produce uh, one or two dozen digital stories in Tijuana. Uh, but I'll share here on this final screen some keywords that have guided us throughout migrant knowledge, uh, migrant autonomy, migrant world making. We really believe that migrants have important knowledge, not just about the suffering that they've gone through, but also about their own kind of autonomous decision making, which may not 
line up exactly with the way migrants get represented in political discourse or the news or even in humanitarian discourse. Migrants are often world making. Uh, their movements change the world. The caravans of late 2018 change the world. Uh, and the changes that they are trying to implement in their lives, but also in the world are ones that we want to try to tap into. How, what kind of knowledge uh, and thinking brings them to the world visions that they have and how can we learn from them? So we don't see us, ourselves as activists who know what's good for migrants and then advocating. We're instead, keywords for us are listening. Uh, listening deeply, and sometimes the stories we learn the most from are the ones that don't make any sense to us because they're not repeating the narratives that we know from the press and from NGOs. Uh, so listening, respect, care, support are key words for us. Uh, Long-term engagement has been important, very, very hard. Uh, humanities projects, you know, you can get funded for a humanities project. That's like a one funding cycle that those funds last for a year, a year and a half, maybe two. If we've managed to keep this going for five and a half years. We're still active. We're gonna be active this summer. So this is very unusual, uh, but we're able to then engage more deeply with the community, follow up more and extend uh, in the beautiful ways that you've seen in the recent slides, some by our grad students uh, getting uh, kind of launching their own uh, linked projects and some by collaborating with other organizations. And I'll just finish, uh, which some of you who know Chicano studies will appreciate. The way that we have been successful uh, is because we are rasquache. We are profundamente rasquache. Uh, what does rasquache mean? It's a word from uh, Chicano art, which has to do with kind of the popular forms of aesthetic expression that you might find in the barrios of Los Angeles among poor families who have little recourses, but they use what little they have to make something beautiful, something uh, that resonates, is meaningful, and is, is aesthetically also beautiful. And so what we do with humanizing deportation is we grab money here and there. We have no ongoing funding from UC Davis. And then we try to use that funding to make the most and make, make uh, what we can as beautiful as possible. And so that's our philosophy that we learned from uh, Chicanos in the barrios of Southern California to be Pasquache. Uh, and with that, I think I'm going to conclude and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can see what's going on. And I look forward to uh, answering your questions or listening to any comments that anyone may have. Thank you so much, Robert. This is truly phenomenal. Um, just thinking about the scope of what has come out of this project, it's, it's truly phenomenal. So I really salute you for this work. Um, a note to everybody, the Q&A is open. So please um, submit your questions there. Um, there is a first question here that I'll, I'll read to get us started. This question is from Tamara Williams. She says, um, thank you, Robert, for your wonderful, wonderful presentation. I have two questions. Could you share more with us about the training you provide your migrant filmmakers? And then the second connects with our first presentation today from our colleagues in Northern Ireland, which relates to the potential impact of this storytelling on mental, mental health or healing of trauma. So the latter part of your presentation suggests that this project is empowering communities of deported migrants. Could you tell us a bit more about this potential impact for the project's participants? Do you want me to repeat yeah. it, Robert? <laughs> no, 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 because I can, I can see the Q&A. So I, okay, great. That, that's very helpful. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so uh, Tamara, thank you for those questions. And it allows me to unpack a little bit uh, because I felt like I, I wanted to share everything uh, in 45 minutes. And there's a lot of details. Uh, and those of you who are familiar with visual storytelling or you know, participatory audiovisual production uh, know that things are much more complicated. So training. Um, so the ones who get trained are our field work teams. They're trained uh, to do the audiovisual visual production that we do and trained in the kinds of uh, to, in, in 
community collaboration protocols that are appropriate for the communities with whom we work. We need to be careful. These are traumatized communities. We can't just like march in there and say, oh, we're going to make videos about you. Do you want, who wants to do it? Uh, so we have a whole kind of method that we follow in engaging with community members, telling them what we do and what we don't do, right? So we're not lawyers. Uh, we cannot like resolve their legal problems. What we can do is share a story that they want to share. We're also not psychologists. So we're not able to offer, uh, you know, real careful um, psychological uh, therapeutic follow-up. Uh, and, and so uh, part of it is because we don't have the resources to do it. Part of it is because I'll tell you, when I, I'll talk in a minute about the kinds of people that we work with. I just can't see how uh, it would work. But anyway, um, what we do is we avoid working with certain kinds of storytellers, like those who have just been deported or those who are clearly in a moment of living trauma. Um, and so we, we try not our best not to do damage and we, we warn people and look for red flags, et cetera. But those are the ones who get trained. So when we're with community, we, we would train them. We would happily train them to do digital storytelling, which is the way digital storytelling is supposed to work. You're supposed to go into the community, train the community, they learn how to do audiovisual production, and then they make these beautiful little simple videos. So uh, just like one example would be Gerardo Sanchez. Gerardo was living in the streets. Uh, he had never, I, I don't believe, ever been on a laptop in his life. Uh, so he had no interest, and there was really no way to conceive of him doing the very tedious audiovisual montage and editing that goes into the production of a five minute video. And this is the case also for people like Emma Sanchez, who had more time uh, and she lived in a house uh, and had a computer there. She was there with her sons, but uh, she had no desire to do that kind of labor, uh, tedious labor of audiovisual editing. And so what we do instead is try to maximize the input of the migrants over the course of the audiovisual production. And so we get a significant input from them on how they want their, um, their uh, visual story to be laid out. We show it to them, we get feedback from them. You should also be aware that they maintain the intellectual, the rights to the intellectual property. So we sign a contract and we don't produce anything. And so they sign it. And with that contract, if they want to withdraw from our website at any time, they have the legal right to do so. And we have the legal obligation to pull their video if they tell us to. So all of that is important. And that lines up kind of with the principles behind digital storytelling. But we're unable to do what digital storytelling tells us to do, which is to not be involved in the production, to just be like guiding people on how to do it. It doesn't work uh, with migrants. It doesn't work with people living in shelters. Uh, it doesn't work with people who might cross the border from one day to the next, uh, who are living in, in sometimes states of flux. And so, um, that, so that, that, that's how we work. It's a significant variation on the digital storytelling model that we lay out in a book that we're publishing at the end of the year. Um, the part about the uh, potential impact, and so we try to be very, very careful, but something that we have learned uh, over time, and I, I don't know that I could kind of theorize this through kind of the theories of, of psychology or, or anything like that, but there's often a cathartic process that happens with us. And I don't know, I don't think it's about making the video. I think it's actually just about listening. Uh, and we learned, we had like our methods that we developed from the, the, story, the story Center, which is the uh, organization that invented and has a manual for doing digital storytelling. We had our adapted kind of steps that we were gonna follow, but we realized we missed a step after the first summer. Between kind of telling them about, telling migrants, this is what we do, this is what the format is like, this is how we're gonna work, and then arriving at defining their, their five-minute story, there was another step, which we call 
el desahogo. Uh, desahogo in Spanish means like letting it all out. Uh, many, many, many migrants have never told these stories before, stories of deportation, stories of why they're fleeing. And so when we sit down and patiently listen to them, there is this step that might last an hour or two of them telling their whole story with a lot of tears from them, a lot of tears from us many times. And that allows them to get to the point of defining a short piece of their story with a message that they want to share. And so, you know, I don't, I can't say that this is what happens with everyone, but this is what we've seen happen a lot of times. And we try to make it the most likely outcome uh, by, by being careful about who we work with. Thank you, Robert. Are there other questions from the audience or comments? Please, you can use the Q&A function to submit them. We have just a few more minutes. Thank you. OK, I'm going to read another question um, here. And uh, since the audience can't see the questions in the Q&A, um, how can we be part of this endeavor? Okay, uh, so thank you. Uh, I see the question is from Laura. Um, so I guess um, I don't, I, uh, there are two ways, I guess. So one of them is as an individual and uh, you could uh, find my email on our website or through the hosts of this event, get my email address and contact me and then we can, you know, have an interchange and see in what ways you as an individual, what skills you have, in what ways you might be able to, to help us. Um, also kind of institutionally, uh, there might be ways that I, you could talk about if you're a faculty member or you could talk with faculty members of uh, figuring out ways to perhaps involve uh, students from PLU in this project remotely in the future. But the way that kind of people who are not funded. So when we have people who are funded, like when we have a lot of money, we can send graduate students to spend a month in Tijuana or in Tapachula and meet migrants and carry out field work and do community outreach and, and all kinds of stuff uh, that's expensive. Uh, when there's not funds involved, we have, a, and I, I mentioned there's a large contingent of undergrads at UC Davis who like love the project, they identify, with the communities represented in the project, they just want to do something. And so we all, always have stuff to do, uh, transcribe and audio tape, translate between English and Spanish. If you know how to mount subtitles into a video, uh, sometimes help us with stuff that we need done in our index, which is a very kind of complicated and messy problem. As I mentioned, our website has a uh, for researchers tab where the, the, there's a, extensive thematic index with links to the videos that treat different themes. Uh, and so sometimes we need help with that. So uh, anyway, we're happy to uh, have volunteers. And so you're welcome to contact me. Thank you. We have another question from Megan Grover um, asking, are there opportunities and appropriate support for impacted children to share their stories and firsthand perspectives? That's a question that came up in my class as well in January when we were studying uh, and, and watching the stories. Yeah, thank you, Megan. So that's an important question. Uh, and one that, you know, uh, the kind of work that we do, um, we have to be very careful about causing potential damage and opening traumas and things like that. We don't work with uh, minors, we just don't. Uh, and so the only time when we would involve a minor uh, in the production of a, a video is if it's with their parents uh, and really understanding what's going on. So for example, Emma Sanchez wanted to involve her three sons in the production of her video. And they were like really proud to be able to say something, each of them in their mom's video. But uh, to get the stories to, for us to record the stories of 12 year olds who have been dragged fleeing from their homes, for example, 
is something that we wouldn't dare to do. I wouldn't know how to go about that. Um, and so, but uh, although sometimes their parents may tell the story in a way that makes clear how it impacted the kids. But, you know, I think the way, um, the best way to help uh, impacted children would be to look at some of the organizations that serve them. And so some of the shelters that we work with, including the Borderline Crisis Center, and also another one called Juventud Dos Mil in Tijuana, uh, serve exclusively migrant families. And most shelters in Tijuana operate on a shoestring. They get sometimes, like sometimes the municipal government will pay their water bill. And sometimes it won't. And they have like donations that come in from the U.S. But uh, if anyone is ever like, looking for uh, a place to donate in Tijuana, I could give them some ideas. Uh, the law school students who are coming with me in two weeks are doing a GoFundMe so that we can show up at the shelters with modest uh, donations that will be very meaningful for them. Robert, we have time for just one more quick question. And I have one, it's probably not quick, but <laughs> maybe we can have a, a quick response. I'm just wondering what made you, um, what motivated you to get into this line of work and research, the, the pivot in your own scholarship in 2016 to begin um, this endeavor of digital storytelling. Yeah, uh, thank you, Emily, uh, uh, for that question. And uh, you will remember that prior to this, I was involved in a smaller scale digital storytelling project in Davis. Uh, we were trying to produce stories of uh, sexually diverse farm workers in California. And it was much harder to do. We had trouble with a community partner that pulled out of an agreement we had with them, and we eventually didn't get very far with it. But anyway, um, that project emerged from discussions with grad students like Emily, uh, uh, who have been like really, it's really ha has been wonderful for me uh, as I learned from grad students and they kind of pushed me to think about things and do things that I would not have otherwise done. And one of them at that time, uh, who's now a professor, Emily knows her name, Tanya Lissarazzo, she's at the University of Maryland in Baltimore County, was going on a bit about being pushed from kind of her style of politicized humanity scholarship to make community interventions. And like community intervention, she felt was something that was more likely to do damage, like go in and grab something and leave. And so uh, we stumbled upon digital storytelling as a way to make an intervention that is much more collaborative and which has much more potential to really kind of not be an intervention that is not wanted, but to be I mean, something that gives a community something that they want and allows them to kind of run with something on their own. And so uh, that's how I got into it. And then we didn't know at that time about the kind of real research element because we're not, you know, we're, we're not going in with a research question except a really general one: uh, what happens to deported people? But uh, so we cannot like ask leading questions to the community storytellers. We just give them the platform, but it opens up the possibility of doing a different kind of research, which is build the archive first, listen to the archive, and then form the research questions. And so it's kind of changed this, the way that I've gone about research for this topic and it's been really um, fulfilling to do that. Thank you so much, Robert. It's um, healing and life-giving to hear about this important work. Um, as a, another person has commented here in the chat, um, she says, Mindy says, I just wanna say thank you. I appreciate all the work that you do to give these people a voice and platform to share their stories, to inspire and inform people that might not be aware of the hardships that they go through. So thank you very much, Robert. Thanks for all your work, for your time with us today. Um, there's a 10 minute break now before the next session. And um, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Can I, can, can I have a last word? Yeah, absolutely, Robert. And so the last word for those of you who are here is that I uh, in kind of thinking with the, all of the migrants that have worked with us, uh, please go and check out our website. Please 
watch a few videos, just a few, uh, and think about ways that you might share the archive. The migrants tell the stories with us because they want them to be shared. They want people to know what has happened to them. So it's a big overwhelming site, uh, but take a, at least a little bit of a look, watch a few videos, and, uh, and then see where that goes. Uh, thank you so much to everyone at PLU for inviting me and for attending today. Thank you, Robert.